And the essence of the Fontan circulation is that only one ventricle is used to pump both of the circulations. But I hope you ask yourself, how frequent is it when you put patients forward for the surgeon to create a functionally univentricular circulation to find that the patients have a truly solitary ventricle, justifying the term which many of you still use, single ventricle. And I put it to you that it is exceedingly rare for you to find patients after you have completed your clinical investigation in which you come to the conclusion that the ventricular mass is a solitary entity. So how can we best describe these patients? I can start off by showing you this rather nice picture which was taken in my garden in London about 20 years ago. And I hope that you all recognize but to your left hand, you see Professor Francis Fontan. I am privileged to have counted Professor Fontan as a friend and a mentor since the early parts of the 1970s. In fact, I was fortunate enough to meet him at the first international conference I attended, which was in Marseille. We then moved from Marseille to Vicenza. And in many ways, Professor Fontan took me in hand and I learned a huge deal from my associations with Francis and sadly he passed on at the end of last year but for me he was a true friend and a true mentor so I can speak with some feeling about the surgical events that have led to what we can now call the functionally univentricular circulation. So if we go back and we ask when was the first operation done to produce the functionally univentricular circulation, we go back to the operation done by Professor Fontan himself in 1969, which was in a patient with tricuspid atresia. And the operation, the Fontan procedure, came to the attention in the early parts of the 1970s, which was when I was starting my own career. As you are all also well aware, it went through several modifications. So Billy Kreutzer in Buenos Aires was thinking along the same way as was Francis in Bordeaux. And Viking Bjork in Stockholm was also contemplating how to improve what we now call the Fontan circulation. But in London, Magdi Yaku appreciated that if you come across patients with double inlet left ventricle, if you close the right atrioventricular valve in this setting, then essentially you produce tricuspid atresia. Then in the 1980s, it was Bill Norwood working initially in Boston and in Philadelphia who designed the series of operations that culminate in the Fontan procedure and permit us now to palliate patients with hyperplastic left heart syndrome. You all know that the worst end of the spectrum of pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum can be treated along the Fontan route, as can some patients with straddling atrioventricular valves, Others in which there is ventricular imbalance, particularly atrioventricular septal defect with right ventricular dominance. In this setting, it may well be that the optimal means of treatment is to proceed along a functionally univentricular route. And we can say the same for many patients who have complex circulatory patterns. So how can we make sense of the variegated anatomy you see in these various settings? So what I'm going to suggest to you is that if we are to understand the anatomic foundation for a functional univentricular circulation, if we are to describe it in adequate fashion, we need to do two things. We need to start off by analyzing what is going on at the atrioventricular junctions. 
And we need to ask the question, are the atrial chambers connecting to only one of the ventricles, or as is usually fa the fashion, the atrial chambers connect to their own ventricle? But that is only half of the problem. Because if we are to find the solution, we also need to describe the ventricular morphology. And here we come to the potentially contentious point. What is the morphologic nature of the ventricle that pumps the blood into the systemic circulation? And is there indeed a second ventricular chamber? Are we truly dealing with a single ventricle? And if not, if in fact there are two ventricles present, how can we describe that arrangement in logical fashion? So let's go back and let's ask the questions as to why we have these problems in description of the so-called single ventricle. So I can take you back to the start of my own career, which, as I say, was when I first met Francis Fonton. And at that time, everybody thought the tricuspid atresia, the lesion which Professor Fontaine first repaired with his operation, tricuspid atresia was considered to be a biventricular heart. In contrast, however, double inlet left ventricle, the lesion which magnet right atrial ventricle valve, that was considered to be the paradigm of what many still consider to be univentricular heart or single ventricle. So was this approach to nomenclature justifiable? Well, here we see the anterior small chamber in tricuspid atresia that is pumping the blood into the pulmonary circulation. And when I started in my career, it was usual to describe the apical part of this ventricle as the ventricular sinus, and then to describe the long component of this hypoplastic right ventricle that is leading up to the pulmonary trunk in this instance. This is a heart from a patient who has concordant ventricular arterial connections and tricuspid atresia. The outflow tract was called the conus, and indeed many still consider this to be a conus. So at the time, this is the early part of the 1970s, people would look at this chamber, and this is the typical chamber that we find in doubling left, left, left ventricle with discordant ventricular arterial connections, doubling left, left ventricle with, if you will, transposition. This chamber was considered to be a right ventricle, but instead was considered to be an infundibular outlet chamber. But note that unlike the small chamber you see to your left hand, in which the morphologically right ventricle is supporting the pulmonary trunk, most often in the setting of double inlet left ventricle, the infundibular outlet chamber supports the aorta, because there are discordant ventricular arterial connections. So it was about this time when I was still working for part of my time in Liverpool at uh, Order Hay Children's Hospital in Liverpool, I came across this heart. Now, when you look at this heart, in which you see the pulmonary trunk is arising from the small anterior chamber, I put it to you that the anatomy of this particular small chamber is no different from that that you see in the setting of tri. And this, of course, is the small chamber you see in the setting of the so called Holmes heart. So this is double inlet left ventricle. Both atrial chambers are joining into the left ventricle, but instead of discordant ventricular arterial connections, we have concordant ventricular arterial connections. So at that time, it became very evident to me that when we look at these two entities, tricuspid atresia, double inlet left ventricle, and when we compare them in the setting 
of the same ventricular arterial connections, there is little difference in the structure of that small anterior chamber. But there are, of course, major differences. And the differences are found at the level of the atrioventricular junctions. So let's look at what's going on at the atrioventricular junctions. So in our investigation of these hearts, this coincided with the advent of cross-sectional echocardiography. We made sections across hearts with these lesions so as to parallel what you were seeing at the time using cross-sectional echocardiography. So now I'm showing you a four-chamber cut through the so-called single ventricle at that time from a patient, the heart from a patient who had double inlet left ventricle. So there you see the right-sided inlet, there you see the left-sided inlet. Both atrioventricular junctions are connected to the same big ventricle that unequivocally has left ventricular trabeculations. When you look at the apex of this big ventricle, you can see the fine crisscrossing apical trabeculations. But when we compare that with what we found in the setting of garden tricuspid atresia, the commonest example of tricuspid atresia, we were surprised to find that the right atrium had no connection with the ventricular mass, because we discovered that tricuspid atresia, rather than representing an imperforate atrioventricular valve, and in one of our forthcoming classrooms, we're going to look at the variations of atrioventricular valvar atresia, and we will find that on occasion, valvar atresia can be produced by an imperforate atrioventricular valve, but in the typical example of tricuspid atresia, as you see here, the essence of the lesion was absence of the right atrioventricular connection. And what that meant was that it was only the left atrioventricular junction that was making connection with the big ventricle that again had fine crisscrossing apical trabeculations telling us that it was a morphologically left ventricle. But were these entities univentricular hearts? Absolutely not. Because in both instances, the hearts had one big and one small chamber. I've already shown you the big chamber morphologically is a left ventricle. So the question that was posed at the time, what is the nature of that small anterior chamber. Is it indeed an infundibular outlet chamber, as was suggested quite some time ago by Helen Tausig and Maud Abbott? Or is it, as we now know, an incomplete right ventricle? And the answer to this conundrum depends entirely on how we analyze normal ventricles. So let's look at some normal ventricles. Many of you will have seen this picture before. I've shown it to you in the setting of sequential segmental analysis. It is a normal right ventricle. I'm showing it to you having removed its parietal wall. And the key to our approach to ventricular description is that we recognize the ventricular mass extends from the atrioventricular junction all the way to the ventricular arterial junction, because that is the extent of the ventricular myocardium. And then when we look at the functional components of this right ventricle, we can see that it has an inlet surrounding the morphologically tricuspid valve. It has an apical trabecular component, which has coarse trabeculations. And then in the right ventricle, there is a long infundibular sleeve freestanding lifts the leaflets of the pulmonary valve away from the base of the ventricular mass. We are analyzing the ventricle in tripartite fashion. And we can do exactly the same to the morphologically left ventricle, because again, we could recognize that the ventricular myocardium extends from the atrioventricular 
to the ventriculoarterial junctions. And then within the chamber, as thus defined, we can recognize an inlet, an apical trabecular component. And this time, again, we see those fine crisscrossing trabeculations that identify this as the morphologically left ventricle. And there an outlet, an outlet that is abbreviated compared to the right ventricle because it lacks a complete muscular infundibulum, but an outlet nonetheless that is supporting the leaflets of the aortic valve. So what we can say is that normal ventricles each have three parts. But we know from our analysis of congenically malformed hearts that these three parts are not always normally sized. But what we also know is that the abnormal chambers that I've already shown you in the setting of double inlet left ventricle and tricuspid atresia, they have the inlets and outlet components shared between them, but not necessarily always in equal fashion. And according to the way the inlets and outlets are shared between the apical components, one ventricle may become dominant, and the other ventricle may then be incomplete. But this means that those hearts that have one big and one small ventricle, they are not anatomically univentricular. So let's go back again and let's look once more at double inlet left ventricle. You will recognize this picture. I've already shown you that the Apical trabeculations, the big ventricle, are fine and crisscrossing, telling us that this is a left ventricle. And the essence of the lesion is that both atrioventricular junctions empty into this dominant left ventricle. So what about the small, now say about the small ventricle? What we can now see when we are analyzing ventricles in tripartite fashion is that this small ventricle possesses an apical component that is itself hypoplastic, but which has right ventricular trabeculations. And in the commonest variant of double inlet left ventricle, this anterior incomplete right ventricle expels its blood into the aorta because the ventricular arterial connections are discordant. So what about tricuspid atresia? As I've already told you, in the 1970s, we discovered that the essential feature of tricuspid atresia was absence of the right atrioventricular connection. And that meant it was only the left atrioventricular junction that was connecting to the big ventricle, which once again had left ventricular trabeculations. In the setting of tricuspid atresia, however, as we've already discussed, most frequently you find concordant ventricular arterial connections, and then it's much easier to recognize the obvious apical component of the incomplete right ventricle, along with a long infundibulum supporting the pulmonary trunk. But what we can say when we analyze both of these hearts in tripartite fashion is that they both have a big left ventricle and they have a small incomplete chamber that is unequivocally a right ventricle and is incomplete because it lacks its inlet component. So neither, when analyzed in terms of their anatomy, is a univentricular heart, or a single ventricle. So I made a fundamental mistake in the latter part of the 1970s when I tried to persuade people that tricuspid atresia was a single ventricle. I was doing that because most people at that time accepted that double inlet left ventricle was a single ventricle. And what I should have done from the outset was to recognize that in fact, double inlet left ventricle, just as with tricuspid atresia, has a dominant left ventricle and an incomplete right ventricle. And what we appreciated, in fact, is that if anything was single, it was the, uni the atrioventricular connection and not the ventricular mass.
So this brings us back to how we categorize hearts. And we follow now the Linnaean approach, we put those entities together, we have features in common, and we distinguish the species according to their differences. So we can make a simple classification of overall hearts with congenital malformations. And we can make a big group of hearts that have biventricular atria ventricular connections. And we can make a much smaller group of those hearts that either have double inlet ventricle or else absence of one of the atrio ventricular connections. And now we know, as I will show you, that both of these groups can produce entities that are functionally univentricular. But when we look at the species, we can choose the feature we like, which might be atrial arrangement, might be double inlet ventricle. We're going to have a classroom devoted to double inlet ventricle. It might be ventricular morphology. Parts with dominant left ventricles can have double inlet or can have absent connection. The ventricular arterial connections can vary. What it means is that when we classify these hearts, having put them into their genuses, we then need to undertake complete sequential segmental analysis. So if we look again at double inlet left ventricle, we see that the left ventricle is the big ventricle, the right ventricle is incomplete. And the essence of the lesion, both atrioventricular junctions connect to the big ventricle. And there we see the septum. Here again, we see it on a angiogram that was produced a long time ago now when I was still working at the Brompton Hospital by Michael Rigby. There we see the septum and the essence of hearts that have dominant left ventricle is that the septum is anterosuperior relative to the atrioventricular valves. And I don't think anyone can now doubt that we are truly dealing with a big dominant left ventricle and a small incomplete right ventricle because this exquisite computed tomogram was made by my colleagues in Newcastle. And clearly there, you see the apical muscular ventricular septum, which is interposed between the big left ventricle, the small incomplete right ventricle. And we know that that septum is the apical septum because it carries the atrioventricular conduction tissues. It's delimited by the perforating branches of the coronary arteries, it truly is the rudimentary ventricular septum. And that tells us why we are not dealing with an anatomically univentricular heart in the setting of double inlet left ventricle. And we know that the incomplete left ventricle oftentimes is leftward, as we see here. And we can describe the communication between the big ventricle, the small ventricle, as the ventricular septum defect. So no longer need we worry ourselves with such arcane descriptions as the bulbo ventricular foramen. We can also recognize that the incomplete right ventricle can be right sided. But again, we can call the channel between the big ventricle, the small ventricle, the ventricular septum defect. And those of you who still worry that in fact that chamber might be no more than an infundibulum, you can look at hearts like this. The big ventricle again has apical left ventricular trabeculations, it has double inlet, it has double outlet. And this, the, if the small chamber were truly an infundibulum in the setting of double inlet, double outlet, there would be nothing left. But there, in fact, Anterosuperially in this heart, we see the remnant of the incomplete right ventricle. This time, it is only the apical component because both of the arterial trunks, along with both of the atrioventricular valves, are arising or leaving the dominant left ventricle. So, no question, double inlet left ventricle is not an anatomically univentricular heart. And the channel between the big left ventricle, the incomplete right ventricle, can simply be described as a ventricular septal defect. But of course, it's not always 
the left ventricle that is dominant when we have functionally univentricular hearts. So here I'm showing you the situation where it is the left ventricle that is incomplete. And now when the left ventricle is incomplete, the right ventricle is dominant. There is the septum. And we see now the common atrioventricular valve in this instance connected to the dominant right ventricle with double outlet from that right ventricle. And here you see one of the earliest angiograms we came across with this entity, double inlet right ventricle. And when we have double inlet right ventricle, when we look carefully, you see that tucked in the back pocket of the ventricular mass, we find the incomplete left ventricle with a hypoplastic septum, but still an apical septum, atrioventricular junction to the dominant ventricle along with both arterial trunks. So the essence of the dominant right ventricle, the septum is postero inferior to the atrioventricular valves. I showed you examples there of double inlet right ventricle with a common atrioventricular valve. And in fact, the connection is still double inlet in the setting of the common valve because both atrioventricular junctions empty into the dominant right ventricle through a common atrioventricular junction. But here I'm showing you double inlet right ventricle with separate atrioventricular valves. There is the right valve, there is the left valve, both connected to the dominant ventricle, which now has coarse apical trabeculations. But once more, this is not a solitary ventricle because when we look posterior inferiorly, there is the remnant of the left ventricle. The left ventricle is incomplete, lacks its inlet, in this instance, lacks its outlet. All that remains is the apical trabecular component, albeit here with a straddling papillary muscle. So the essence of double inlet right ventricle is that it is the right ventricle that is dominant, once more, not anatomically univentricular. So can you have a truly univentricular heart? Well, you can, but it is very rare. Of the hearts that I've seen that are truly univentricular, I can count on the fingers of both my hands. This is perhaps the nicest example, and this is one of the earliest hearts that I was confronted with when I was working at the Brompton Hospital in the 1970s. There you see both atrioventricular valves coming into the ventricle, both arterial valves supported by the ventricle. It has exceedingly coarse apical trabeculations, and we looked all over this heart for a second chamber. We could not find one. So that is the truly univentricular heart of solitary and indeterminate trabecular pattern. So what that means is that when we want to distinguish between the functionally univentricular hearts, we need to find the septum. And if we find an apical septum, which is a true rudimentary ventricular septum, because it carries the conduction system, nourished by the perforating arteries, it will be anterior when it is the left ventricle that is dominant. It will be posterior when the right ventricle is dominant. And in those hearts with truly solitary and indeterminate ventricular chambers, there will be no apical septum. But on occasion, the septum can be intermediate as you see here with straddling and overriding of the right atrioventricular valve. So you're looking here at an exquisite heart that is from the archive that's held in the University of Florida in Gainesville. And this heart, in fact, was prepared a long time ago now by Lodewijk van Meerop, a superb anatomist, embryologist, pediatric cardiologist, who worked throughout his career at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And Lodovic has made this lovely window dissection to show you the malaligned ventricular septum. But in this instance, the straddling right atrioventricular valve is mostly connected to the dominant left ventricle, meaning that in essence, 
we have double inlet left ventricle. But as you all know, you can also find hearts with straddling and overriding of the right atrioventricular valve, as you see here, the key feature being septal malalignment, but now with most of the straddling valve connected to the right ventricle, giving us effective concordant atrioventricular connections. These hearts represent a spectrum and potentially part of the spectrum might be suitable for biventricular atrioventricular connections, part might be suitable for functionally univentricular connections. And that's why we are talking about a spectrum of malformation. So we know that some of those hearts that have biventricular atrioventricular connections can also be functionally univentricular. I've just shown you an example with straddling of the atrioventricular valve in hearts that have unbalanced atrioventricular septal defect. When the right ventricle is dominant, the left ventricle may be incapable of pumping the systemic circulation. And so those hearts will also be functionally univentricular despite the fact that they have biventricular atrioventricular connections. When we come on to look at hearts that have atrioventricular valvar atresia, I'm going to show you that on occasion, some of those hearts can have biventricular AV connections, but with imperforate atrioventricular valves. And then we have hyperplastic left heart syndrome, hyperplastic right heart pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum. And here, despite the presence in the majority of these individuals of biventricular atrioventricular connections, the hearts are functionally univentricular. So we're going to devote a complete session to hyperplastic left heart syndrome. And what we're going to find, that this in fact is a combination of phenotypes. The hearts can have mitral atresia, they can have mitral stenosis, they can combine with aortic atresia or aortic stenosis. But the key feature in these individuals, the left ventricle is not capable of supporting the systemic circulation. So in the classical cases, all the cases are functionally univentricular, although in a minority of cases, the small left ventricle may be of comparable size to the, to the mitral valve, the aortic valve, the so-called hyperplastic left heart complex. And I'll discuss that with you when we move on to look specifically at hyperplastic left heart syndrome. But the majority of cases will either have this arrangement, which you see has absence of the left atrioventricular connection. In this instance, the left ventricle is slip-like. It is never going to support the systemic circulation, but there is no fibroelastosis in this setting. The majority of cases are like this, however, in which you have a patent mitral valve that is stenotic, but the left ventricle is thick-walled, it is a hypoplastic cavity, but is lined with fibroelastosis. And it's most unusual that ventricles of this sort are again ever going to support the systemic circulation, meaning that despite the fact we have biventricular atrioventricular connections, we have functionally univentricular hearts. And we can see a comparable spectrum when we assess pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum. It too is a spectrum of malformation. And we know that the essence of this lesion is overgrowth of the right ventricular cavity by mural hypertrophy. And in all of these individuals, the right ventricle retains its tripartite nature and the mural hypertrophy squeezes out the cavity. So it is the cavity that can be tripartite, bipartite, or unipartite, and depending upon the extent of the mural hypertrophy, the hearts themselves can be functionally biventricular or functionally univentricular. So when there is minimal overgrowth of the apical component, as you see here in the setting of an imperfect pulmonary valve, a good-sized right ventricle, there is 
imperfect valve guarding the ventricular arterial junction, the valve can readily be perforated, and these patients can be put forward for biventricular correction. But compare that with this situation. You see that the mural hypertrophy has totally obliterated the apex of the right ventricle. It's also obliterated what was initially the infundibulum. So now the cavity of the right ventricle is no more than the hypoplastic inlet part. And when we look down into the atretic pulmonary root, we see the tri-radiating sinuses, but there is no evidence of what presumably was there at the outset. There was a pulmonary valve initially, but it has become obliterated. And it's very likely that these patients, many of whom have fistulous communications between the cavity of the right ventricle, the coronary arteries, it's very likely many of these patients will go on to a functionally univentricular repair. So if I summarize my introduction to the functionally univentricular heart, solitary ventricles are as rare as hen's teeth. So the majority of the hearts, which many of you, I'm sure, still suggest are single ventricles or are univentricular. In fact, they have one big and they have one small ventricle. What I hope I've shown you is that such hearts, with one big, one small ventricle, can have univentricular atrioventricular connections, double inlet, absence of one atrioventricular connection. But in many instances, they have biventricular atrioventricular connections. But despite that, one of the ventricles is big and one of the ventricles is small. So what I hope I've shown you is that simply by describing the functionally univentricular arrangement, we are restoring logic to what for decades has been a contentious entity and which hopefully now is no longer contentious. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look specifically at the morphology that makes up the subsets of the functionally univentricular heart, double inlet ventricles, atrioventricular valvar atresia, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum. But above all, we need to remember that almost all of these patients are not anatomically univentricular, but they do have functionally univentricular hearts. It was an amazing presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anderson. And uh, I have to say that we are really lucky, and this is a bless for all of us to be able to listen from you all, all of that and to see the beginning of our field because you are, you are one of the pioneers. You are discovering the diseases. You are analyzing. And with your talk today, we were able to see how this work was done. And it was a really, really privilege for us to listen uh, uh, to that. So now we can open for, for questions and to, I don't know if Dr. Silverman has something to, to comment before we open to questions. Uh, Norman? You are muted. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much, Grace. And Bob, thank you for a, a very clear and precise um, description of the functionally single ventricle. Bob, um, the one entity that I come across is the entity that uh, confuses a lot of people, and that's a, a functionally univentricular connection with an absent left connection. Uh, and I don't, didn't see you show any images of this particular um, entity. It's something that uh, we see fairly often. That's the question. Have you got some uh, images of that, that uh, issue for us? Uh, can you well, comment in fact, on it? In fact, Norman, I did show one example because I showed an example of uh, hyperplastic left heart syndrome, in which I pointed out sure. that uh, the mitral valve in that instance had presumably been present at the start of development, but yeah. had become 
absent, and that was absence of the left atrioventricular connection in the setting of a dominant right ventricle. As you say, in other instances, you can have a dominant left ventricle with a absence of the left atrioventricular connection. I couldn't show everything that we find in the setting of dominant left ventricle, but I will be discussing that when we come on to specifically devote this session to atrioventricular valvar atresia, because the absent connection can either be on the right side or it can be on the left side. So I thought I was covering that by showing the absent left connection in the setting of a dominant right ventricle, but that obviously passed you by. Well, I'm sorry about that. If it passed me by, it might have passed somebody else by. Indeed. But, um, my, Indeed. Issue, my issue is that uh, that heart is usually a heart with um, discordant atrioventricular uh, arterial connections and a small anterior superior um, outlet uh, ventricle, the right morphologically right ventricle. And it's, it's exactly identical to the double inlet left ventricle with the usual double inlet left ventricle, but with an absence of the connection from the, um, of the left side. Indeed, I, uh, co uh, correct, but you can in fact also have absence of the left AV connection when the incomplete right ventricle is right-sided. And in the past, that was a controversial issue. And it just shows that any combination is possible. As I say, I will be discussing this when we come on to discuss the variants of atrioventricular valvar atresia. But the point you make, the, the similarity that you are emphasizing between the lesion you've just described, which many people call tricuspid atresia without transposition. I think that's a terrible term because in fact, the connection is absent on the left side rather than the right side. So that's confusing for starters, but we will be discussing that when we come on to devote our attention to how, how we should analyze hearts with absence with, a, with atrioventricular valvar atresia. Thank you, Bob, and that's a great commercial and a reason to come and watch your next session. Absolutely, it will. In fact, it'll be. Uh, I think we're going to do it in the order, as far as I can go: uh, pulmonary atresia with intact septum, then hyperplastic left heart syndrome. Because nowadays, I think many more of patients, as you know well, if you look at the patients who now and uh, who have the Fontan procedure, the majority of the patients have hyperplastic That's left exactly. heart syndrome. Exactly. And then I think the cases nowadays who come forward with either the variant that you've just described or the variant with classical tricuspid atresia, they're probably in the minority, which is paradoxical in a way because it is those hearts that we argued so much about when you also, you will remember the huge controversies that took place at the back part of the 1970s, the early part of the 1980s. And uh, it, I suppose you could say that it was the advent of the, the approach to hyperplastic left heart syndrome that focused our attention on all of these variants. Correct. Anyway, that was uh, great and um, very clear. And uh, I certainly think that uh, your line of reasoning is outstanding. Thank you. And hopefully in the, in the fullness of time, you will be showing the echo correlations of all these features. I hope so, thank you, yes. We, we hope so too, Dr. Silverman. It's going to be amazing when we are able to have all of the pathologies with the correlation of, of the images as well. I want to make one question. It's not related exactly to this topic, but I'm really curious about how did you do this, guys? How, how did you describe the anatomy? How did you discuss with each other in the 1970s when there was no internet, there was a, a difficult to travel, difficult to communicate. How was it? How, how was the development of my field? I'm really curious to know about it. It's, uh, it's very interesting because despite the difficulty in traveling, Norman was a frequent visitor to my department and he created total havoc. <laughs> Nowadays, when I was at the Brompton Hospital, Norman would come over and would spend weeks going through all of my slides, and now Norman is the only one who has copies of my slides. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm always with you. I can just open my collection and see you, uh, all of your pictures. <laughs> 
but it is true. I mean, and uh, Norman was one of the first people to develop cross-sectional echocardiography, what we call two-dimensional echocardiography, when he was at Stanford when he started that before he moved to UCSF. Of course, now he's back going between the two, but it was really the advent as a, of cross-sectional echocardiography and the need to make the comparisons between the two that that focused our attention on these differences. And that's when we realized that rather than the ventricular mass being univentricular, it was the atrioventricular connection that was univentricular. Correct. Very nice. We have, oh, I'm mute. Okay, no, I'm not mute. We have some questions on the Q&A box. I'm going to uh, make them for you. And uh, Jorge is asking, is there a difference between an incomplete ventricle versus a hypoplastic ventricle? That all depends on the nature of the ventricle. The ventricle can be hypoplastic because it is small and it can be hypoplastic because it is incomplete. So all incomplete ventricles are hypoplastic but not all hypoplastic ventricles are incomplete. So in pulmonary atresia with intact septum, for example, as I try to emphasize, the, the small right ventricle has all of its three parts and can be hypoplastic, but hence is not incomplete. So the, the, we, we used to use the term uh, rudimentary ventricle, but it was Andrew Reddington who pointed out that rudimentary was less than satisfactory because rudimentary doesn't necessarily convey what we're trying to say, that the incomplete ventricle is one that lacks one of its normal three parts. But in my experience, the ventricles that lack one of their three parts typically are also hypoplastic. I suppose you could say that in double, out, double outlet right ventricle, where the left ventricle is incomplete in lacking its outlet component, in that instance, the left ventricle is not necessarily hypoplastic. So you have to put the two together, the number of parts, the size of the chambers before you can decide whether the ventricle is, or rather the extent of hypoplasia of that particular ventricle. Amazing. Uh, I have one last question uh, before we close. Uh, this is a question from Miguel. He's asking, are there cardiomyopathies in single ventricle hearts? Well, there can be. I mean, the cardiomyopathy, uh, anything. Well, Norman, you probably are better placed to answer that. I mean, I guess, have, you, have you seen patients who have... Uh, Cardiomyopathies coexist. There's no reason why they shouldn't coexist. But I mean, how would you uh, answer that? Maybe I, on I, the fingers just, of. Uh, sorry, Doctor uh, Norman. Just to comment here in the Middle East, we have a lot of patients with that, with a combination of a cardiom cardiomyopathies and. Uh, and uh, uh, lesions of single ventricles or other uh, forms of uh, congenital heart defects, you something that to, I have never seen before. Grace, you mean functionally univentricular? Because I, I should. Think I'm about... sorry, this is true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, go ahead, Norman, please answer that. Well, I think that uh, the fa uh, failure of the systemic ventricle in the functionally univentricular heart is not uncommon. And uh, the question is. Uh, is this primary or secondary? I think largely they are secondary. Um, the number of primary cardiomyopathies um, that I've seen in uh, functionally single ventricles is rare. But secondary uh, failure is quite common. Okay. And um, we have with us... That's an important point, Grace, because what Norman is talking about, the the heart failure in the setting of the situation he's describing, as he says, is secondary. So typically you would not call that uh, cardiomyopathy, would you? I mean, one thing that we should say is that the lesion known as non-compaction, which I think is much better considered to be excessive trabeculation, that can be found in the setting of uh, left isomerism. In that setting, you can also have double inlet ventricle. 
So that is, but I would not, I do not think that excessive trabeculation should be considered a cardiomyopathy, although it is considered one at the moment, but the, the essential cardiomyopathies are dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and then we have right ventricular uh, arrhythmogenesis. So I'm not sure that any of those um, primary cardiomyopathies necessarily go along with, with the functional univentricular heart, do they, Norman? I think that's the point you were making, is it not? Yes, I agree. That's right, yes. Although I'm, I don't right. want to have a, a fight with you on uh, non-compaction <laughs> or excessive trabeculation, but uh, it's becoming clearer that there are genetic uh, relationships to this entity. Oh, I, I don't doubt that, but... Uh, I guess if we accept it as excessive trabeculation, then we can, but I, I, the one thing for sure it is not is failure of compaction of the, uh, of the trabeculations. Right, exactly. Now that's clear. But it's what, are, what we've seen, what we've seen here in the Middle East, at least here in, in Qatar, we've seen several of these patients very early on the course of the disease, like with two months old, three months old, or with dilated cardiomyopathy, or with hypertrophic card cardiomyopathy, and a congenital heart defect, some of them isomerism, some of them uh, another forms of uh, functional univentricular hearts. And this is something that is very uh, particular because I've never seen before. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting point you make, Grace, and that's worthy of further consideration, as I think uh, that is an important point. Uh, but I think you do need to document that they have specific primary cardiomyopathies rather than the secondary cardiomyopathy that Norman was emphasizing. Yeah, they, they all are getting uh, exoma and all other genetic uh, workup and MRI on all of that. I think we are going to have very interesting material to, to share soon. I mean, there's no, absolutely no reason why you shouldn't have coincid coincidence of, of a primary cardiomyopathy with a congenital cardiac malformation. In the fullness of time, I mean, you're bound to see that combination. And I guess you're seeing it m more in, in, in your environment because of the greater uh, genetic intermixture and what have you. Yes, I think that's exactly the reason. We have a lot of consanguineous marriages in the region. So we have a lot of genetical problems. Okay, it was uh, an amazing, amazing session. Thank you very much. Questions. We don't have any more questions. I did very well Let's to see. with so few okay. questions. I well. think we have... Uh, does the function differ when using the right versus left ventricle for systemic circulation? In other words, do left ventricles do a better job of doing systemic circulation than right ventricles in the functional in univentricular heart, that's particular very, after surgical palliation? That's an excellent question. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. And uh, uh, I don't... It's also a very difficult one to answer. I'm, I'm not sure that the jury is, 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 is in on that, is it yet, Norman? Uh, Bob, yes, I think that um, the latest work suggests, in fact, that the right ventricles, if you look at the uh, large series in the United States where they've, uh, the, um, uh, they've uh, collaborated across institutions, is that, uh, surprisingly, the right ventricles do almost as well as the left ventricles, so that statistically you can't see a difference. Uh, it's sort of counterintuitive because of the structure of the right and the left ventricles, but people have also noted that in the, uh, the accommodation of a functionally right ventricle as uh, the dominant ventricle after Fontan, there are certain changes in the um, way the right ventricle functions that makes it more like a left ventricle. So yeah. the answer is the jury is still out. Uh, although it's counterintuitive, it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference in the long-term follow-up of these patients. There you go. There are some things that I cannot answer because I only see the hearts once. It's the follow-up that's going <laughs> to give the... Uh, 
the, the answers to that, but it's a very good question. And as Norman says, we still need more information on this, but it is fascinating, as you also say, Norman, that the right ventricle does try to, uh, to compensate. And, and we know that in some instances, patients with congenitally corrected transposition, which have a pumping right ventricle to the systemic circulation, they can live till they're 90 years old and you can find that as, as, an, as a chance finding, but we also know that that is very much the exception rather than the rule. So right. there's no reason why the right ventricle should not pump for a lifetime, so. We have another question from Dr. Kamal from Pakistan. He is asking about the possibility of a hypoplastic or a small ventricle to grow when uh, it's volume loaded. Another very good question. And uh, again, I think uh, that depends on whether the ventricle is complete or incomplete. I think that in the setting of pulmonary atresia with intact septum, if you correct those to a biventricular circulation, then without question, the, the right ventricle can grow and can achieve its normal dimensions. And I guess the same goes um, for the left ventricle. I mean, we know that the, on occasion, the, uh, the small, the rarely you can achieve uh, biventricular repair in the setting of so-called hyperplastic left heart complex. And then again, the small left ventricle will achieve its normal size. And if we think of uh, uh, totally enormous pulmonary venous connection. Oftentimes when we look at that, the left ventricle seems small, but you put the flow back into it and it will grow. So I think that these things do have the opportunity to grow. But again, I'm not the best guy to answer that. I think, but the, the potential has to be there. Do you want to comment on that, uh, Norman? No, I don't think so. I think that uh, Bob did an excellent job. Thank you. Amazing. Sasha, do you want to say something? Thank you very much. I think, as you say, that the people must be happy because uh, it's a unique and real uh, exceptional opportunity to have uh, uh, Bob Anderson, who, who is revising himself. Who is, uh, <laughs> uh, we continue to learn all the time. Yeah. That's the beauty of these, uh, yeah. these classrooms, because I get asked very good questions, and then we all the time we have to we have to revise our ideas with the evidence that comes before us yeah this is uh, for me the best so i yeah, this is <laughs> sorry we see you on monday with uh, norman and i hope if bob will be free you can he can join us also on monday it's at it's at uh, one hour later at uh, rome time right 4 p.m rome time yes okay. it's a tea time tea time in London. <laughs> yeah, okay. Breakfast Hi. time. Breakfast time in California, Norman. <laughs> it's, uh, that's right, Bob. You'll have to wait a little bit longer before you open your bottle of wine. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs>